Do you need to find a skeleton? How would you tell people that design? You personally, how would you tell that design? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on this. Hey there, YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Look, you know why you're here. It's to hear the conclusion of this Dan Biddle speech, or talk, or whatever it is. We're talking about why humans are definitely not evolved, and why, I guess, paleoanthropology is just not a thing. So without further ado, here's Dan. Okay, so uh, our, here's Artie, an artist's rendition of, of Artie, and here's a bonobo, a modern cousin to a chimpanzee. Looks similar to me. Yes, Artie, being a basal hominid, looks like a basal ape. And the ways in which chimpanzees are derived tend to still result in basal appearance to human eyes, so of course they look similar. They are similar. Look at her toe hanging out there. It's called a hallux. It's designed, God gave apes toes for hanging up on trees. So based upon a little bump on her pelvis, an imagined uh, lower lumbar vertebrae, a couple of extra imagined lower lumbar vertebrae, and half of the foramen magnum. Which again is more than enough to determine a habitual terrestrial stance. Go on, Mr. Biddle. They say she was an upright walker. Yeah, based on clear and sufficient evidence, they do. They also say that she was considerably more arboreal than later hominins like Australopithecus, in large part due to the fact that her big toes were opposable instead of in line. That would make her better at climbing than modern humans and worse at bipedality. But that doesn't make her not a biped. Guess after guess after guess after guess. Apparently, a reasoned inference is just a guess. Of course, I'd call that the part of science where we are making predictions. And, you know, the weird thing is that predictions of evolution, like the bare existence of non-human bipedal apes, keep coming true. Weird, that. So here's what her uh, feet look like. This is already, she's got this hallux that goes out to the side. Humans have no, no feature like this at all. Chimps have it because they get around in trees. Correct again, which is why scientists have concluded that Artie was spending a huge portion of her time in the trees. Okay, we're going to speed through Lucy here because it's getting, uh, getting, getting late because I think most of you were here uh, last night when we covered this. You know what, I was there the last time we covered this, so I think I'll just link to that and won't go over Lucy again. Homo habilis, this is the best type set of bones that they found for Homo habilis. This is the next stage in human evolution, they say, as I mentioned last night. Gee, Dan really does love to pretend that the first specimen of a species is the only one, except when it suits him not to. And putting up contested bones does not bode well. If you haven't seen Guts of Gibbon's series on this book, you really should. I'll link to it. They show all kinds of homo habilis creatures in lots of textbook, but they, their count of upright or of complete homo habilis fossils is zero. They've never found a complete one. Of course not. Complete fossils are exceedingly rare. We have zero complete T-Rex fossils, but you don't hear creationists complaining that we got T-Rex badly wrong. In fact, they seem oddly chill about dinosaur reconstruction, short of feathers. But you get to hominin reconstructions, which are no more speculative than a typical dinosaur reconstruction, and suddenly they get all cagey. It's just a mix-up taxon of about a hundred different bone fragments that they invented an icon to group that set of bones. Yeah, no. So that's the contention of Sanford and Roop in Contested Bones, but the problem is that we have scanned these bones and we know they come from single individuals. We have found them associated, in situ, and upon laser scanning, the joints fit together perfectly like hand and glove. These specimens are not multi-specific chimeras. They are actual individual organisms, and not only do we find mosaics between the bones, each bone itself is a mosaic between earlier Australopithecine morphology and later Homo. This is the best set of bones. Originally, it was found mixed with some accidental bones from other creatures, so they pulled those ones out. This is what they have left. Yeah, except like I said, precision laser scanning has determined that the bones assigned to the four specimens of Homo habilis are actually those of four individuals, and even if they were not, they would still be transitional in character individually, and so cannot represent an assemblage of mixed human and non-human ape or sarcopithecid bones. Uh, and, and so... They, here's one of the most telling things you can learn about Homo habilis. The name Homo habilis means handyman. So they think humans by this stage were starting to walk upright and starting to think with their brain. No, they were walking upright a long time before H. habilis. 
do some cognition and making tools. But let's learn about this hut foundation that they found in the same area that they found Homo habilis bones. Let's see if this actually honestly represents the evidence. Also, wish me luck at even finding his sources, since Dan seems loath to provide them, except in the rarest of circumstances. The evidence that humans were actually the inhabitants of this site is also confirmed by a 12-foot circular foundation made of lava stones for a hut shelter they found in the same archaeological bed where Homo habilis bones were found. And of course we don't have a citation. Paleo experts even describe this circular stone foundation as having a striking similarity to the dome-shaped hut shelters still made today by nomadic people in the same area. But it gets even better. They actually found the stone circle in a layer beneath Homo habilis bones. Now, that's not faring well for the theory of evolution. Of course, being me, I managed to track down this whole claim to Leakey's 1963 Olduvai Gorge book. Because if you dig far enough on the Genesis Apologetics website, that's what they cite. Unfortunately, that book isn't even on Google Scholar. I don't see any way for me to access it short of actually finding a hard copy, which is unlikely. But also, why are we looking at a work from over a half century ago? The field of paleoanthropology has come a long way since then. Either way, why is this looking bad for human evolution? Homo habilis is so named because of their skill at producing stone tools. I don't see any particular reason they couldn't make a simple stone hut. Even gorillas managed to make circular structures called nests out of plant matter. Are we supposed to presume that the animals that can nap up until this point unprecedentedly sophisticated stone tools couldn't also put some rocks in a circle and maybe put up some branches? That seems perfectly reasonable. Evolution isn't predicting that H. habilis was a blundering brute who couldn't think its way out of a paper bag. They were almost certainly not as intelligent or as creative as Homo sapiens, but that doesn't make them inept. Isn't that interesting? They found a human-built structure below the bones they found Homo habilis on. How do we know this structure couldn't be built by the ancestors of the animals whose bones we found and identified as H. habilis? Look, I'm not sure if any part of Dan's story is true, since the best I can find for a source is a book that's probably older than he is, and that seems not to be available for me to fact check in anything even approaching a timely fashion. But Dan has just presumed that if a hut like the one they found is made by modern humans, it couldn't have been made by a species before Homo sapiens. There is no reason to assume this. Dan is arguing in a circle. Only, quote, true humans can make this kind of hut because I say so. This hut was found, therefore it can't be H. habilis, because I already assume that they can't make it. That's not really how arguments work. You don't get to assume your conclusion. Although, to be fair, this is how presuppositional apologetics works, and maybe Dan is getting into that. But it's also why basically no one besides presuppers take presuppers seriously. So how does that work for the theory? It completely debunks it. If by completely debunk you mean doesn't in any way present a challenge, then sure. Because humans were here building these stone structures that had six different pillars, 12 foot circular radius. They found all, almost all of the tool debitage, like the tool discards for stone tools outside the hut. They found the bones from when they were eating outside the hut. And then on top, in a layer higher than this, they find Homo habilis bones, but they say these evolved from those. Yes. Why are we assuming that earlier species and H. sapiens couldn't build a hut? Is Dan going to tell us? It's, it's that, that one thing alone throws Homo habilis completely out the window, and there's what the stone hut circle uh, looks like. And a uh, big circle, about 12 feet in radius, and here's a very similar idea of what people build today in the similar regions of these stone huts. And they can do thatch works. People have been doing these circular uh, huts for a long, long time. Yeah, a long, long time. Like apparently two and a half million years back before they were Homo sapiens. Let's go on to Neanderthals. Okay, I guess I'm not even going to attempt to explain why he's precluding H. habilis from hut building. So that's the last lineup here. So when, when I was a kid in school or when my dad was in school or my grandpa was in school, this is the Neanderthal that we got. He's a half man, half ape, this brutish beast. Being a half man, half ape is like being half gecko, half lizard. It doesn't make any sense. Humans are fully ape, not half ape. Neanderthals were fully ape. Homo habilis was fully ape. Australopithecus afarensis was fully ape. And he's out there getting ready to club stuff. He's got a big old club here. Look, clubs are pretty basic tools that have been used for all of known human history. I'm pretty sure Neanderthals did use clubs, but whatever. 
and he was betrayed. This is in the, in the London News. Everybody growing up about Neanderthals viewed them as cavemen, prehistoric kind of cavemen. We find evidence of them living in caves, and they were extinct long before history started, so prehistoric cavemen does seem apt, even if, yes, they were not the animalistic brutes that we see them depicted as in the very racist early and mid-20th century. But then, over the last 10 years, we've learned all kinds of stuff about, about these uh, creatures. They were completely human. See, here is where we get into the problem of what does it mean to be human? If you mean being a member of H. sapiens, then no, Neanderthals were not human. Although they were a sister group that's far closer to humans than chimpanzees are, so they would have been extremely similar in most ways. But if we take human to mean late members of genus Homo, then sure, Neanderthals were completely human. And I doubt you'd get too many paleoanthropologists who'd complain too much about that determination, provided they agreed with that definition of human. That's the current stance of science scientists. They had families with people we would call today as Homo sapiens, or they were interbreeding because they were just human. There was indeed interbreeding, but it seems there was trouble. For instance, we never seem to get the Neanderthal Y chromosome passing into any H. sapiens line. This probably means that H. sapiens and H. neanderthalensis could only reproduce together if the male was H. sapiens and the female was H. neanderthalensis. So it seems that there was not complete interfertility, as we would expect from two very closely related but still separate species. I mean, saying a Neanderthal is a caveman is like saying that they're like, when you com compare the phenotype or the body, uh, the body style and characteristics of a Samoan to a Japanese person, there's lots of differences there, right? Far, far fewer than there are between Neanderthals and H. sapiens, and also far, far, far fewer genetic differences. But yes, the kinds of minor differences we see within a species can build up to become differences between species if populations spend long enough not interbreeding. It's almost like that's kind of the whole point of evolution, and Dan here is pointing out evidence for evolution. Neanderthals were just big stocky guys, had thick bones, about 15% larger heads than, than some people. They were thick and they were living and surviving in caves after the flood. Well, there was no global flood. But yes, Neanderthals had thicker bones than modern humans. They also had sloping foreheads, more pronounced brow ridges, no chins, a barrel-shaped chest that goes significantly wider from top to bottom, an occipital bun at the back of the skull, etc. These are not the same animals as H. sapiens. Although, yes, they were extremely similar. So they made instruments, they made weapons, they buried their dead in cer with ceremonial uh, 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 burials. They would bury them with flowers and everything. And now they say that they're out combing beaches and went diving for shells to use them as tools. Yep, Neanderthals were not the animalistic brutes we once thought they were. But we already covered it, and I don't see how it matters to whether humans share ancestry with other animals. So they call them Neanderthal beachcombers. So they're clearly just humans. They were recently able to extract some DNA from the toe bone of a Neanderthal, completely human. Interestingly, the DNA sequences of Neanderthals is how we know that they were definitely a separate species. Their diversity falls outside the range of Homo sapiens. They are less closely related to H. sapiens than the two most divergent members of H. sapiens are to each other. That makes them a distinct breeding population with a long time of isolation that started before H. sapiens comes on the scene in Africa. They can sequence it. It's a little bit, you know, you, you, can, you can mark human DNA from any different group and they can go back and show your overlap to Neanderthals, but they're just people. Yep, we can tell if modern humans have some Neanderthal DNA. But, you know, because we know Neanderthal DNA pretty well, and it's primarily on that basis that they are considered a different species. So that's basically the story. We have Artie here, they say, five to four to a million years ago. Then she's followed up by Lucy, goes on to the imagine, and this is all the bones we have for Lucy. No, that's all the bones at one point we had for Australopithecus afarensis. The one specimen Lucy is not synonymous with her whole species. Goes on to Homo habilis, only 100 bone pieces. This is the best typeset that they have for Homo habilis. Apparently, Dan doesn't even know what a typeset is. It's just the set of specimens that are used to define a species. You can find better fossils afterwards, but they don't become the new typeset. You can propose a neotype, but usually that only happens if the original typeset is extremely poor or has somehow been lost or destroyed. We have found much more complete remains for Homo habilis. And did you know that in this next period that they say between 3 million years ago and 2 million years ago, 
They say the only fossils that they have for that period, you could take them and put them into a shoe box and still have room left for putting the shoes back in. What? Lacunae exist in the fossil record? Vach. <laughs> no, wait. Everyone in the field already knew that. And just like with a lacuna in a manuscript, it doesn't mean we have no idea what is missing, nor does it mean we can't figure out the plot of the story. A whole million years of supposed human evolution, and they got a half a shoebox of fossils. And that's because of their, their stacking and how they do it with radiometric dating and everything. But this is all a story. These are either, these are hum, Homo erectus is humans. Sure, with a wide definition for human, H. erectus is human. I mean, that's the definition I see used here in a fair bit of counter-creationism content. I believe R. N. Ra famously tends to use as his definition for human members of genus Homo. Now, there is a minor problem that who is in Homo is arbitrary, making who counts as human also arbitrary. But guess what? Humans put things into arbitrary groups all the time. It's convenient. So I don't really object to this use, although I tend to be a bit more restrictive with the term human myself. Homo sapiens are humans, Neanderthals are humans, Homo habilis is an imaginary mixed taxon, probably uh, some, maybe some human fossils mixed in there with some uh, Australopithecines. Right, with joints that were measured to precisely match each other between these supposed mixed bones. There's a reason no actual paleoanthropologist takes contested bones seriously. And Australopithecines are just extinct ape, and so was Artie was an extinct ape. Yeah, and so are Neanderthals. But where were all the other hominins? What about Australopithecus sediba? What about H. heidelbergensis? Denisovans? H. floresiensis? What about the robust Australopithecines? I don't know if Dan knows, but there are a lot more hominins than his paltry examples, some of which were in his earlier slides. And then, hey, that was it. That was his last argument before a Q&A session that wasn't included in the original video. This also means that less than half of that hour-long video was actually talking about evolution while making new points that weren't just a rehash of his earlier Lucy comments, which again are in my other series on Dan Biddle, Revenge of the Biddle. Well, anyway, this whole experience felt like the gang tried to read Charlie's dream journal. Dan has probably the worst and least argument-like arguments currently available outside of Dinosaur Adventureland. Oh well, if you like this video, please remember to hit like, and if you're not already subscribed, please do so. Finally, turn on all notifications with the bell icon so you're always notified when there's new Dapper Dino content, assuming, you know, YouTube actually bothers to do their job. Anyway, I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. I just want to take a minute to thank my patrons and channel members, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Ben Tovend, Denny525, Ian Chen, John Ackerman, Landon Knoll, Lingue, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Bead, and Patrick Dennis. My channel members and patrons help keep the lights on here at Casa Dino, and they also help make this channel possible, because without them, you'd be lucky to get one video a week out of me, never mind three. If you'd like to support either as a patron or a channel member, there are links below. Also, if a monthly pledge or even an annual pledge isn't right for you, there are other ways you can support the channel. There's a merch store and an Amazon wishlist. And of course, if none of that's right for you, just hitting like, sharing this video, and commenting really helps out a lot. Thank you.